using my Bressa USB microscope which I purchased for the sum of six pounds from Age Concern. This came with software and the microscope. No extras but I had a few bits and pieces lying around to help me. I've been having a look at some of the stuff from my allotment. Now at times 20 um, using by pressing the button three times you get illumination from above and below and this, believe it or not, is a blackberry leaf. So let's have a look and see what it looks like on my little computer. Well there you go. And there's the right up to the edge of the blackberry leaf. And you can see there's various leaf veins and inside those cells there will be the chloroplasts and you can even tell different types of leaves some of them whether they're they've got protection on them or not and of course these have on a black black um blackberry leaf underneath the blackberry leaf i don't know whether you can make it out but there's some structures there that's the sort of um spiny almost like needle like structures going along that main leaf vein there and that's on the underside there and so underneath them they're, they're, they're quite they've got a lot of protection i noticed in my garden that sparrows love to feed underneath these so do blue tits and this is the place underneath the blackberry leaf where you're going to get um aphids or caterpillars or such such like hiding um and spiders of course and then they need them to feed their young and they love um blackberries basically birds for this purpose and this is its protective mechanism underneath it. This is from my Ulan gauge leaf and it's showing the effect of blight which is a blossom blight and the fungus itself has also attacked the leaves. It's punctured holes through the leaves as you can see these little white holes this hole in the middle of the leaf shows you the fungus which works by um, putting enzymes outside itself to digest living things. So it's got these um, enzymes which, which is excretes and basically that's what's sort of eating away at this leaf. Here we have a leaf skeleton, that's a leaf which has been overwintered and basically desiccated and then all of the networks of the leaf, all the xylem and the phloem where you know the sap flows and water of course have been carried up by the xylem with various minerals and the phloem carrying the, um, the sugars etc that's made in photosynthesis but here this leaf is which is dead it's interesting just to see the skeleton and the actual specimen itself underneath the microscope here if I can get just show you that it's there again another dead leaf and here's um, saprophytes these are um, organisms which feed on dead and decaying material and these are basically digested using their enzymes digested as much living material as they can from the leaf when it's fallen from the tree and as, as it's dried out um, that's you've left with these little black spots this shows the underside of a red currant leaf and this one's healthy and again you can see it's quite sort of hairy underneath the leaf structure here. Um, some of my red currants were infected by spores similar to pear rust and I found it may well have been related to my Ulan Gage harbouring infection. I've treated the canker um, with one part milk, two parts water, a couple of drops of detergent and three teaspoons of bicarb to about a litre, sprayed them, cut out all the dead wood opened up the tree canopy, removed all the infected things, um, put them in a separate bin bag to dispose of and picked off any leaves on my plot which had been infected. So this is a basic shot using a software program and you get a few trial ones on the disc with this Bretta USB microscope and here we have a very soft watercolour paintbrush and I put poly dusted pollen on this, this was used ex exclusively just for plum trees so I had various different types of plumbers, uh, Ulan Gage, or Wheelan Gage, I don't know how you pronounce that. There was also uh, Opal Plum, Saar Plum, Rithcasetta, which I've not seen it online, but I got that one from Aldi a couple of years ago. 
and Victoria plum and I basically just went around cross pollinating them um, using this little brush so there's bits of pollen on it still there under the microscope at times 350 pollen grains which are those little these little dots you can see on the on the brush are more obvious and that's as powerful as this uh, goes obviously you can increase the size of the image yourself and blow it up even more using software but that's as much as this USB microscope does but you can see pollen grains that's for sure here we have a leaf skeleton and I've got a lot of potted plants outside which is like primrose I've also got holly and I've also got some red a red currant bush as opposed as opposed to the fruit I use a red currant bush for um, pollinators basically but this is what a leaf uh, skeleton looks like at times 20 And this is from a variegated holly, which is just outside of my uh, front door and does produce berries in the last few years. But as you see, this is the uh, a desiccated leaf and you can see the where the thorns are about to come off there. Here we have a prunus species, I believe it's Deutsche, under the uh, Bresser microscope and a little, lots of little black dots on it, which I presume is where it's been broken down by um, micro, you know, uh, probably fungi or something like that, but there shows up on the uh, microscope at times 20 on this on this dead leaf, which is totally desiccated and brown. Very interesting, isn't it? Here you have the midrib of a desiccated um, holly leaf, and you can see there's a specimen under the microscope there, and this is the same holly leaf going towards the edge. Where this brilliant adaptation of the sp of the uh, spines that they have on the leaves here, and you can see how it curves, and the leaf veins here are obviously all long since died, but uh, the veins going out towards the actual edge of this leaf, classically adapted, isn't it, holly tree with uh, with its waxy leaf? And here we have a strawberry. This is a strawberry top from a strawberry variety which I got, and I've dried some of them on a paper towel and you knock them off you can either use fingernails I think my other half's used fingernails or you can use a sharp pair of tweezers and flick them off and I've got some of these which I'm uh, hoping will germinate I'm still waiting for my other temptation seeds to germinate so I've had to rely on the little ones little plantlets I bought in um, plugs which have got like a sort of a gel plug with them but uh, these are exactly the same type of seeds I've been trying to get from a supermarket variety because people recommended to have a go at germinating these. Using times 350 on the Bresser USB microscope I thought I'd have a look at something that I thought was quite interesting it's when you've overwintered um, some onions and I wanted to see what the actual sort of stalk looked like at high power to see if you could see individual plant cells in my little six pound um, second-hand USB microscope well I turned the contrast um, up and the brightness down a bit and on my um, basic uh, old XP laptop I believe I can make out re long rectangular shaped um, plant cells which seem to be connected inside the cytoplasm I can actually see what looks like what may be nucleus and also vacuoles and uh, some cytoplasm so they, these look like and chloroplasts on some of them because of course they are green which means that they um, absorb all, all the uh, all other colors and green's the color which they transmit so plants don't need the green light and um, that's because they are green the rest of the light they're absorbing these plant cells from the onion seem to have areas of gaps around them and it's quite a stringy uh, thing an onion isn't it so Thought that was quite, it's just quite interesting to have a look or to zoom in a bit more but you can, I don't know whether you can see it very clearly you can make out these sort of there are shapes there and there each one of those sort of long oblong shapes is a plant cell at times 20 looking at the uh, onions this is the view and you can see there are literally thousands and thousands of plant cells and, and a very sort of open uh, mechanism between each plant cell seems to be like gaps at times 80 
the plant cells become more individually recognisable and you certainly can see the gaps in between them as well which could just be areas where water is stored or plant sap is, is uh, coming up the store. At time 3.50 you can start to see much more detail the plant cells have to have uh, the uh, tubes to transport water around the xylem and the phloem that transports around the sugars that the plant makes by photosynthesis and certainly you can start to see that there's some cellular structure not bad for a, for a very basic little USB microscope and you can see some details on the things you grow in your allotment This is an almond leaf at times 350 and this is a bit that's been unaffected by leaf curl. The leaf curl disease, fungal disease, affects things such as there, and there it's a leaf pore and these where you get exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen and that's basically this area here this is like a circular area, which is actually a pore on the leaf, and that's where gas exchange takes place. And photos, you know, the uh, carbon dioxide is used for photosynthesis. And there's like a sort of like a, a tinge, like a violet sort of reddish tinge, where the, where the fungus itself seems to be invading all across all the living cells. At times 20, you can just see how invasive this fungi is, and it actually literally. Um, takes over the actual leaf cells you can see the ones there wh where this sort of dark almost sort of like liver coloured um, patches of in there is a little patches there where the fungus hasn't quite got yet and you can see that there's various leaf veins there and in between the leaf veins you've got um, cells there some of them some of them cells will have pores and others of course individual cells have got the chloroplast and you can see what the effect of the effect of this fungus is it basically just completely destroys the leaf's ability to carry out its job of photosynthesis. At a magnification of times eighty you can start to see the invasion occurring there on the right hand side and you've got cells that haven't yet been um, infected and seem to be in groups around where the leaf leaf veins that transport the sugars um, that are made and then eventually stored as starches around the plant so the leaf is actually vital for survival and this is from an almond tree it's always been affected by leaf curl and this year started treating it this is some uh, crabapple blossom petal and I've magnified it up 20 times it's been falling into my uh, water, uh, garden water, which is in a water, little water bath I use for birds, and uh, it sort of uh, stripped it out to more, to, so more or less just looks like a skeleton. But I just love the sort of delicate structures you see under the microscope. This is the very edge where the blossom actually will join to the rest of the other blossoms. Um, on the flower here and I've magnified that up 20 times on the uh, USB microscope. Each one of those black lines is from my ruler which is a plastic ruler and is one millimeter so it shows you how much that this uh, magnification is working looking at this crab apple blossom so it gives you an idea you can use use this to measure sort of, sort of a scale if you like to find out rough distances between things on the features. A nice tender stalk of rhubarb. This is the outer skin of rhubarb at times 20. At times 350 you can start to make out individual plant cells, these oblong shaped things that look like building blocks in lines and you can start to see some detail inside them including nuclei and various vacuole and starch grains. At times 80 you get a much better sense of the stringy structure of rhubarb. You can see the different, the red coloration here set against the green.
This is a nettle underside of the leaf at times 80 and they're like hypodermic syringes and full of formic acid. You can see the needles on it there on the underside. But of course um, birds will look for insects underneath plants like this and nettle tea they say is very good for you, very healthy, full of vitamin C. So it does have its upsides. Also makes a fantastic compost and can be used in your uh, compost bin as an activator but in the, in the solution as well can make a compost. Here at times 80 you can really see the network of uh, needles underneath the nettle leaf itself and as I said earlier full of formic acid and uh, the best antidote we have here in the UK are dock leaves to neutralise this uh, acid. A variegated laurel and you can see the difference between the areas where there's lots of the green pigment chlorophyll and uh, areas where there isn't, where it's all yellow. The laurel leaf also has spines and I noticed that as you go higher up the bush the more spines you get so it's its own protective mechanism plus it's a very waxy leaf that protects it from attack from pests but also from water loss but it does make these beautiful red berries not the most tasty berries but the birds will eat them I've seen blackbirds eat them these are dandelion seeds um, and of course any allotment holder who's near you and doesn't weed this is what you really do not want because these are prolific and they're wind blown of course perfectly um, designed of course to be carried on the wind and uh, of course if you've got any dandelions then you'll know as I have found out that they have incredibly deep tap roots sometimes three spades deep even deeper on the plot that I took over um, but then again dandelion still makes can still make a tea and apparently it's um, very good uh, it has some herbal herbal uses as well and um, it, if people suffer from excessive fluid retention but with herbal remedies you've got to check up what to do how to use the uh, dandelion so there you go this is your classic lobed weed low growing type variety blanketing the ground, capturing as much sunlight as it can and quite a tough leaf on this one here. This one, this one I, as I recall found near the hedgerow has small purple flowers. This shows the underside of honeysuckle leaf and all the ribbed structures. It reminds you of the sort of, the, uh, sort of architecture that you see in various medieval uh, churches. Well it does me anyway, look at the sort of uh, the way the, they're in, interconnected and the way that the leaf the, the ribs are here are sort of all interconnected with each other that's um, honeysuckle and of course very popular with bumblebees this when, when it goes into flower I've had bumblebees certainly um, nesting up in my roof quite a lot really um, until I put mothballs up there to stop uh, squirrels getting in this is uh, dock leaf and of course where I live in the UK it's a great relief when you find one of these if you've been um, got by a nettle or had any sting which is an acid sting rather than alkaline sting because these will neutralise uh, the sting and basically what we do in the UK is we basically just crush it and rub it over the area where you've been stung and it can provide a lot of relief so dock leaves very handy although considered a weed it does have its uses here we have lemon balm which in the UK grows very well it's quite scented and if you put it in a bowl of water and heat it up in your microwave it will help to freshen up your microwave it can also be used in various cooking recipes and I found out also you can make a tea from it which is soporific that is if you suffer from insomnia uh, you have to look at the instructions of how to use it correctly and your medication but it can sometimes be useful um, to aid with sleep um, you can make a tea from it for that purpose so there you go, it's a useful herb, lemon balm